Yep. Good morning, Wellies. Uh, a happy Sabbath morning to you. We're coming to you live from Chattanooga, Tennessee, where it's cloudy, overcast, and probably in the upper 50s, I would guess. So not exactly a gorgeous Sabbath day. You're going to get some rain here. If you're watching from somewhere other than uh, southeast Tennessee or Hamilton County, but we're glad that you are joining us no matter where you are joining us from. Uh, good to have you here, so to speak. A um, couple things I want to let you know about, and then I'm going to turn the worship over to Amos and Alexa. Uh, just a reminder again that our online market that uh, is selling items that our kids have made to raise money for the Bethlehem Center and the Read, Read to Lead program, uh, that online market is open still through, I think, the remainder of today, maybe even into tomorrow morning. I think pickup for items is tomorrow afternoon, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, just want to remind you, if you've got some financial margin in your life this holiday season and you could support our kids and the fantastic job that they have done in putting a lot of time and energy into making a lot of different things to sell to raise money for the Bethlehem Center, which is an organization in our city, which meets the needs of some of our marginalized folks on the south side. Uh, we'd appreciate your help with that. Uh, it's just a good way to affirm our kids and uh, help disciple them. And you can access that online market by going to the website and looking in the upper right-hand corner and you'll see a little line that says online market. You click there and it'll take you to uh, the page where you can see all sorts of cool items for sale from birdhouses to legume art, bean art. I think um, Luca Burkett uh, did some of that artwork. We've got sugar scrubs. I think Tabby uh, Beck did some sugar scrubs along with her mom. Uh, we've got, uh, let's see, I already mentioned birdhouses. We got, I think the, I don't know if the marshmallow shooter guns sold out, but I, from what I understand, the Wilders are able to continue to manufacture more if the need presents itself. So those have been a very popular item this holiday season is the marshmallow uh, guns. Uh, so there's just all kinds of good stuff there. It's just, but the most important thing is to find a way to support our kids, to affirm them and their practice of the middle part of our mission statement, which is practicing compassion. And these kids have invested themselves in doing this, and um, it's just a really cool thing. So check out the online market. The other thing I want to mention is December 24, Christmas Eve at 7 p.m., we will air a well Christmas Eve service. It will be pre-recorded, um, and a lot of work is going into that even as we speak. And I want to say thanks to Bridget Mabuto for all her work and managing the logistics of that. But our musicians will be involved, our kids will be involved, readings, poetry, music. Great way to celebrate the reason for the season, which is Jesus and his arrival here the first time on planet Earth. And so that's December 24, 7 p.m. That's when we'll air that. And I uh, just want to let you know, remind you of that. Uh, our speaker today is not me. It, it, you got a good speaker today, Jessica Williams. I have known Jessica for... Wow, almost feels like 20 years now. Uh, Jessica and I worked together at Southern Adventist University back when we were working with a worship service on campus there. Jessica has been a friend for a long time, and I appreciate her teaching this morning. Uh, she currently serves as a recruiter for Southern Adventist University. And uh, so, Jessica, thank you for taking this role. Really glad to have you uh, sharing with us today. So at this point, I'm going to pray for us real quick. You've heard enough from me already. Preachers find a way to speak, even on weekends that they don't speak. So I'm going to pray for us, turn it over to Amos and Alexa, and disappear off stage. Father God, we just celebrate you this morning, and especially this time of the year, we celebrate Jesus and his first arrival with us. We celebrate the fact that at a point in history, God Almighty took on human flesh, moved into the neighborhood, and did life with us. And that is something that is really, truly beyond our human comprehension. Uh, but to the degree that we can understand it and do understand it, we say thank you and we worship you. And so as we worship you in music this morning, as Jessica teaches, uh, my prayer is that your spirit will take our offerings of worship, imperfect as they may be, and that your spirit will apply them to each and every heart in ways that meet the needs of each and every individual. So... 
Thank you, God, for being the, the God that you are, for your grace, for your love, Jesus, for your visitation to us. And um, we worship you this morning. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, all one person waves at me here. <laughs> oh, two now. Thank you, Mike. See, you came for a very important reason. Um, so Christmas season is upon us. Uh, we get the, the privilege, the it's kind of like the written in the book of the first person, people to do Christmas music. Um, and it, I was thinking about that. I'm not a big fan of Christmas music, and there may be other people out there who are on their couch going, yes, fellow soul. Um, it's an interesting uh, group, set, collection of songs, and as a society, we kind of stopped at a certain point in the past and said, don't write any more Christmas songs. We don't like them. You can write them, but we won't like them. And, uh, and then as you practice these songs, they're all about the same thing. We're going to sing four songs today. Guess what? They're all about the same event. Uh, you know, spoiler. <laughs> but, as Mike was just mentioning, um, it's a pretty significant event. And despite society's reluctance to accept new versions or new retellings of that event, the ones we have are pretty humble. Some of them are even a little misleading. We sing about the little baby Jesus in a manger, and apparently he's such a good kid, he doesn't cry, you know. Who knows? But it was a pretty amazing event. Um, I think of the line, and I cannot remember where it is, but this description of God with us. Regardless of whether it's the first time or the second time, every time that God is with us will be a very significant event. And so I'd, I invite you to think about that. Um, as we sing our four humble versions of the same event and you hear other songs throughout your week, throughout the month, to remember what a um, significant, um, hard to describe, hard to explain, hard to give words that give credence to the event, how important it is, how big it is. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept their watching, no silent flocks by night. Behold, throughout the heavens there shone a holy light. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. The shepherds feared and trembled. When low above the earth rang out the angel chorus that hailed our Savior's birth. Earth, go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Down in a lowly manger. The humble Christ was born. And God sent us salvation that blessed Christmas morn. Oh, go 
Lord. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. That Jesus, that Jesus Christ is born. See, that was weird. We went from this very big thing to... Whatever that was. <laughs> Away in a manger, no crib for his bed. The little Lord Jesus lay down his sweet head. The stars in the bright sky look down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. The cattle are lowing, the poor baby wakes. The little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. I love thee, Lord Jesus, look down from the sky And stay by my cradle till morning is nigh Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask thee to stay Close by me forever and love me, I pray Bless all the dear children in thy tender care, and take us to heaven to live with thee there. The stars in the bright sky look down where he lay, the little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. This might be a new song to some people. Uh, it's a Bebo Norman song. Um, if you don't catch on to the uh, lyrics in the verse, feel free to sing in the chorus. It's very uh, simple. It's come and worship. Come and worship. Come and worship. Worship Christ, the newborn King. Christ. 
Christ, the newborn King. Come and worship, come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ, the going to be tricky but in the middle of a pandemic that's what that's what happens <laughs> thank you Amos and Alexa for the music and Mike thank you for the opportunity to speak today um, it's an honor and a privilege to be part of your church again so thank you I love Christmas I love pretty much everything about it in fact, um, the decorations, the reds and greens and golds and silvers. I love going out into the neighborhood and looking at the lights on the houses and just the way people have worked so hard at making their yards festive. I love the giving and exchanging of gifts. Uh, and I love remembering Christmases of the past. Uh, I grew up in West Virginia, and we didn't always have snow at Christmas time, but many times we did, and it was always just so special to have a white Christmas. I remember being in the kitchen with my mom, baking Christmas cookies and making candy, and then sometimes we would gather in the living room and sing Christmas songs as my dad played the guitar. Decorating the Christmas tree was always a family affair, and... Um, I just, I loved Christmas time as a kid, and I still love it today. But I have a rule, and this rule is that I don't start the Christmas festivities until after Thanksgiving. I want to give every holiday its due time in the spotlight, and, and Thanksgiving as well. But this year, I broke my rule. This year, I just really felt like I needed some Christmas cheer a little earlier than usual. I mean, 2020 has been pretty gloomy. And I just, I, I, needed, I needed some Christmas cheer. And perhaps some of you felt the same way. Perhaps you found yourself 
pulling out the Christmas decorations or turning to that Christmas station a little earlier than usual. I know for me, it was mid-November. I started listening to Christmas songs. Those decorations came out the week before Thanksgiving. Um, but we, those of us, those of you who share uh, the same feeling that I had this year, we are not alone. In fact, there are many who began the festivities earlier than usual this year. I was reading in the Washington Post online several days ago, and on November 24, there was an article about this very thing. And the headline of the article reads like this. It's dark outside. Families are putting up Christmas lights to offset the gloom. In that article, in the very first few paragraphs, a woman named Julie Zimmer was interviewed. She's actually a lawyer for the federal government in Maryland. And her family typically would turn their lights on after Thanksgiving. However, this year, they, they brought, they, they started hanging those lights a week before October. October, a week before Halloween. And this is what she says about this. She says, they're just, they bring happiness. They're bright on a dark night. Mike asked us to share our take on Christmas, or to share our take on the Advent this month. Two weeks ago, Lisa Diller shared about the waiting throughout the Christmas story, and what that waiting and all that it comes with means for us in the here and now. But my focus today will be on a different aspect of the Advent. We're going to go back before the Nativity, actually, before the Magi, before the Shepherds, before the journey to Bethlehem. We're going to go back even before the angel appeared to Mary to tell her that she would be expecting. We're going to go back to another gloomy time. So if you have your Bibles with you, or if you want to open your phones to that Bible app that you typically use, I want you to turn to the book of Isaiah. And while you're turning there, we're actually going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 8, the end of Isaiah chapter 8. While you're finding that spot, I just want to give you a little bit of history and a little bit of the context of what was going on at the time of the writing of Isaiah. The Assyrian army had invaded Israel. Not once, not twice, but four times in the span of six years. And the king of Assyria, whose name was Tiglath-Pileser III, he is known as one of the most successful military commanders in world history because he conquered most of the world, known to the Assyrians, by the time that his reign ended. He's also known for creating the first professional army. So anyone who has made the, the military their career, it can all be traced back to this guy, this king of Assyria. He loved to go on military campaigns, and we know this because out of his 17-year reign, he only missed one year of military campaigning. And he was good. In fact, um, the Assyrian warfare was known for a couple different things. Number one, they were known for their massive armies. You see, because Tiglath-Pileser III created a professional army, he had a, a huge amount of men that were trained throughout the year and could campaign throughout the year. And this army, this massive army, was equipped with the world's first great siege machines that were manipulated by an efficient corps of engineers. It would be the equivalent of our tanks of today, so to speak. So, massive armies that were well equipped, and Assyrian warfare was known for their psychological terror. And this was their most successful, most effective weapon. 
the Assyrians were ruthless. Historians write that when the Assyrians would invade an area and fighting would ensue, they would take the corpses of the men that they fought against and they would impale them on stakes throughout the region. Sometimes they would cut off the heads of these corpses and, and pile them in heaps. And sometimes historians write that they would take their captives and skin them alive. Can you imagine? <laughs> and this is what Israel faced four times. The Assyrian invasions of the 8th century, 8th, 8th century BC were some of the most traumatic political events in the history of Israel. Israel was in great distress, particularly the border regions to the north and to the east, the areas where the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali were located. During the invasion of Assyria, or by Assyria, King Tiglath-Pileser III, one thing he did was he took people captive from this region in northern Israel, and he resettled them in places throughout the Assyrian Empire. There was a definite point to this. Um, the point was that he wanted to create a new population. He wanted to strip them of their identity, their culture, and create a new population with a shared culture and common identity, that of the Assyrians. From the time of this captivity, these northern regions of Israel were literally in darkness subject to foreign powers and without the ministry of a priest or a prophet until the coming of the Messiah. Isaiah chapter 8 um, gives a description of the state of Israel at this time. And we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 8 verses 21 and 22. And as we read, I just want you to feel the sense of the heaviness uh, that the people were experiencing at the time. This is what it says, Isaiah chapter 8, verses 21 and 22. Distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged, and looking upward will curse their king and their god. Then they will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom, and they will be thrust into utter darkness. That was the state of Israel at the time of the writing of the book of Isaiah. But thankfully, Isaiah doesn't stop here. He continues because something changes, the tide turns. Isaiah 9, verse 1, he says, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. Did you catch that? <laughs> for the people in northern Israel, Isaiah says there will be no more gloom. There will be light instead of darkness. Their joy will be increased. There will be no more oppression and no more war. 
One day, things will be better. One day, things will be brighter. So what's the game changer? What is it that comes in and changes everything? Well, Isaiah tells us in verse 6, very familiar text to us at this time of year. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So, what is it? that's going to change everything, there's a new king, right? A new ruler, a child, a son that is given. And this new king, this new ruler, will be in charge. Um, But what kind of ruler will this be? I mean, Israel has dealt with a number of kings and rulers up to this point, some of them good, some of them not so good. And then here we have the king of Assyria, who was not good. So what about this new king? Well, Isaiah describes him, right, with four names. First of all, he says that he'll be called Wonderful Counselor. Now, if we were to go into the Hebrew and really dissect what Isaiah was trying to convey with this name— Uh, The word counselor actually points to the Messiah as a king who determines upon and carries out a plan of action. In other words, Isaiah is saying, the Lord whose plan is wonderful. This son of David will carry out a program that will cause the world to marvel. You might be thinking, well, what is this plan? What is this program? Isaiah actually goes into it a few chapters later in chapter 11. We don't have time to look at it right now, but if you want to look at it later, um, it's very interesting. And I can tell you this, no king, no ruler, no president, no prime minister has had a plan this good. Second name, Isaiah gives this new king, this new ruler, is Mighty God. This will not be a weak ruler that can be overthrown at any whim. No, this king will rule with divine power and strength and might. The third name he gives him is Everlasting Father. He will be an enduring, compassionate provider and protector. And lastly, Isaiah calls him Prince of Peace. His rule will bring wholeness and well-being to individuals and society. Isaiah continues the description of this king and his rule in verse 7. He says, Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This new king will rule with justice and righteousness. And because of his great love, God's great love, his zeal for them, things are going to change. And change they did. If we were to look at a map of northern Israel, these areas of Zebulun and Naphtali, and if we were to fast forward 700 years to the time of the writing of the Gospels, we would recognize some of these places, right? Some of these cities and towns, they would be familiar to us. Town of Nazareth, Jesus' childhood home, Capernaum, where Jesus lived during his ministry, his home base, if you would. There were many miracles that Jesus performed in Capernaum. You have the town of Cana, 
where the first miracle took place, turning water to wine. Gennesaret, where Jesus walked on water and where he healed a multitude. There is Bethsaida, the hometown of Peter and Andrew and Philip, and the location of the feeding of the 5,000. And there was the town of Nain, the place where Jesus raised to life the son of a widow. These areas that experienced so much darkness at the time of Isaiah would indeed see a great light, the light of the world. God in the flesh, teaching and preaching and healing, restoring sight to the blind, causing the lame and the paralyzed to walk, raising the dead to life. Yes, the land of Zebulun and Naphtali would see a great light. This place that experienced so much darkness, in this place, a light would dawn. These words of Isaiah, these promises that were written 700 years before the coming of the Messiah, these words were a glimmer of hope in the midst of darkness. In 1914, the Great War began, otherwise known as World War I. Over 9 million combatants and 7 million civilians died. It's known as one of the most deadliest conflicts in history. It was expected to be a relatively short war and one of great movement. However, it ended up being neither. At the beginning, there was a lot of movement, but then came a stalemate and trench warfare set in. Death was the constant companion of the soldiers who fought in the trenches. Um, they had to deal with constant shell fire and sniper bullets. Mental and nervous breakdowns were common due to the unrelenting shell fire and the claustrophobic conditions of the trenches. There was no real sewage management so, as you can imagine, this led to parasites and the spread of disease. There was a rat infestation. Lice was a problem. And because they fought in the trenches, there was no real covering, no real shelter from the elements. So it was cold, it was wet. They had to, some of them had to deal with fungal infections, known as trench foot. And then there was the smell. The smell of the overflowing latrines, days and weeks of dried sweat, and the rotting corpses both in and around the trenches. Darkness covered the Western Front. But in the midst of that darkness, on Christmas Eve in 1914, something incredible happened. Something known today as the Christmas Truce. I have a video clip that I want to show you. It's actually a commercial that was made in 2014 commemorating the 100th anniversary of this um, event. So uh, it's, it's a commercial for chocolate. It's by the Sainsbury Chocolate Company. Um, but you will see that it's, de it, it's based on real life events, based on the accounts of the soldiers and officers who were there that Christmas Eve and Christmas morning. Watch. Jenkins. Oakley. No.
Was traute hochheilige My name is Jim. My name is Otto. Pleased to meet you, Otto. Freut mich. Rose, she's called. Um, it's schön. Um, it's schön. So this Christmas truce actually took place along several areas of the Western Front. It wasn't just in one location. Um, and actually, from what I read, it was actually the Germans that were the ones that were to start it. So um, this is a British commercial. So I'm maybe, maybe there were some areas where the British were the ones that, uh, that reached out first. But... <laughs> So I have a quote that I'd like to read to you. It's from the Times in 1915, and it's from one of the officers that was there at one of these areas along the Western Front where the Christmas truce took place, and this is what he says about it. It is a great hope for future peace when two great nations hating each other as foes have seldom hated should on Christmas Day, and for all that the word implies, lay down their arms, exchange smokes, and wish each other happiness. So why is it that there are people who have pulled out their Christmas decorations and turned the dial on the radio to that Christmas station and started hanging their lights earlier than usual this year? Hope. Hope. This year, 2020, has been darker than most. We're in the middle of a global pandemic. The death toll is rising every day. We have had to live in isolation for weeks and months of this year. We've had to keep our distance. Right? We've had to make these uh, part of our everyday wardrobe, everyday attire. Um, we have not been able to gather like we normally can with friends. This has changed our lives. On top of that, um, we 
in our own nation have lived through a contentious presidential election. There is immense political division. And through the last several months, we have witnessed a rise in racial injustice and violence. Natural disasters have come through, the fires out west, the tornado that came through our very own town and devastated businesses and destroyed homes. I mean, this has been a dark year. And that's not even mentioning the things that we have to deal with and have affected us personally. Not to say that those things don't affect us personally, because they do, but then you have, you know, people that are dealing with the loss of a loved one or uh, an illness, financial trouble, maybe the loss of a job, broken relationships, just an increase of stress and anxiety, loneliness. Whatever you have faced this year, for those of you who feel as if you are in the midst of darkness, however it's manifested, Christmas is for you. Isaiah reminds us that the birth of Jesus is about hope. Hope that better days are ahead. Hope that our situation will improve. Hope that this is not how it will always be. So if you find yourself in the midst of darkness today, this month, this year, Remember, Christmas is for you. Jesus came into our world. He came into, he entered the human story for you. To bring light, to bring life, and to bring hope. So hold on. Take courage. And look to the horizon. The light has dawned. The first Noel, the angels did say, was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay, in fields where they lay keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night.
right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful for um, your entering into our world and into our human story. And God, um, thank you so much for that gift. And Lord, um, may we remember that in you is light and that life is, there, that life is the light of men. Um, so God, may we remember this, um, this year, this Christmas season. Thank you so much for that gift. In your name we pray. Amen. Have a great week.